Neil Agate was a young man. He was working as a medical doctor and he died at the age of 28. Um, a recent inquest has indicated this was due to police brutality. He was locked up in isolation. That meant no access to lawyers, no direct access to families. And in those conditions, he was certainly beaten up, brutalized, and eventually he was found dead in his cell. And I think it's been established it was suicide, uh, that the earlier verdict of suicide was completely wrong, that he was killed by the police. Deliberately or accidentally, we don't know. Now, what brought him into the situation? My younger brother, Neil, um, went to study in medicine at Cape Town. He's two years behind me. So somewhere around 1975, I went to visit him. And one of his friends was Neil Agate. They were in the same, same year, medical school. And so I met Neil then, but just as one of my brother's friends. Then uh, it must have been at the end of 76 or 77, and then we became really best friends, you know. Um, so right from then till, till he died, till he was killed, um, we, were, we were very, very close friends. Neil came to Kingswood in 1964. In other words, we were in Standard 4 at the junior school. And yeah, we've been in the same class uh, all the way through till, till matric. I was introduced to Dr. Neil Eggett by Dr. Gavin Anderson, who was my friend and comrade. Um, we were working together in the trade unions. I was in the junior school um, when Neil arrived in 1964. Um, I was in the standard below him, but the junior school was pretty small, so we all knew each other. Um, and so I would have met him pretty soon after he arrived in 1964. I first met Neil probably in around 1979 because it turned out that his union and my union found uh, had a similar outlook on how trade unionism should develop in South Africa. Comrade Nilaget was introduced to me by Comrade Sam Kikini, who was at that time, the General Secretary of the South African Allied Workers Union. I met Comrade Neil Aget here in Johannesburg. At that time, he was a volunteer organizer of the African Food and Canning Workers Union, which was based in Cape Town. Neil was born in Kenya and his family had a farm on the slopes of Mount Kenya and it was the period of the Mau Mau Rebellion and they left at, in, at Kenyan independence and came to South Africa and I think he was about eight years old and then he went to school in Makanda and then he came to UCT to do medicine on a bursary and that's where I met him. I'm Professor Lucien van der Walt, and I'm currently director of the Neil Agate Labour Studies Unit. Neil Agate was a, grew up in Kenya, he's from a white family in Kenya, which moved over to South Africa when he was quite young. And he went to school in what was then Grahamstown, and is now Makanda. He went to Kingswood. He was an idealistic young man. He was quite influenced by religion in his younger years, and really a man very sensitive to suffering and the lack of dignity other human beings faced in societies that were very unequal, like our own. My name is Jill Berger, the second child in the family, and Neil Agate is my younger brother, 
who was born four and a half years after I was born. So we were very much um, brought up uh, on a farm in Kenya, um, sent to boarding school at a very young age, uh, where we had to learn to be very independent. In 1964, my parents moved to South Africa and Neil, Michael and myself were sent to boarding school in Grahamstown in South Africa. We were at separate schools in Grahamstown. I was at a girls' school, he was at boys' school. My name is Robert Charlton. I'm an old Kingswoodian. I was here at Kingswood from 1961 uh, to 1971 as a school pupil. I remember Neil uh, clearly, uh, but I was one standard below him. And, uh, but I was in the high school. I was in his boarding house, which uh, is Gain House. And for a while, for about six months, I was in the same dormitory as him. So um, I do remember him. And uh, I was friendly with Neil, um, and, uh, but not a close friend of his. My name is Alan Stark. Uh, I was a boarder at Kingswood from 1963 to 1970. I would say he was one of the bright, he was part of the, the uh, Payne's Trust with three or four top guys in the class and the rest of us just hang on behind. Um, we were in the same hostel in the junior school in Jake's house and in the same dormitory. They were big dorms so you didn't really know everybody very well. Then in senior school he was in Gain House and I was in Woodhouse. He always came across to me as a very conscientious, hardworking, honest kind of a guy. His nickname was Doc. The reason he was named Doc was he had one ambition and that was to be a doctor. And we knew that from standard four. <laughs> His nickname was Doc, which is, it's in a way, a prophetic kind of name because he later became a doctor. But right back in those days, he'd expressed a desire to become a doctor. I think his um, brother had gone into the, the, the medical field. As he went through school, I remember when we were in the Gay and House dormitories, uh, he was part of a group called Focus, uh, which was a Christian fellowship group, which is something people might not know about, Neil. Um, and uh, we used to go to Focus on uh, Tuesday nights, I think it was uh, during second prep. And uh, Neil was a kind of leading member of, of, that, uh, of that group. Maybe a bit of his idealism uh, might have originated. Um, his concern about his fellow man and his um, kind of thing of standing up against injustice. At school, he had become uh, the head of house of the junior school, which was quite interesting because I think any young man appointed to that role would have had to have an element of compassion and empathy for people who perhaps were left pr less privileged just through their age. When Neil was at medical school, he had decided that he would not go for military conscription and that he would leave the country. And in fact, that was the case for many, many young white men at the time. So for example, in my medical school class, half the class left to avoid military conscription. And he graduated in 76. So even before the 76 struggle, um, he had decided he didn't want to go to the army. He made a moral decision that there was no way that he was going to go into an army where he would be told to go and shoot young black people. He'd take um, short jobs like at Tembisa, but not long enough that he'd get onto the books, you know, because then they could trace him. So Tembisa, Varagwanath. And, um, but in that, he was also constantly talking with other white men. Like, no, you can't go. You know, you can, you can leave, you can go to prison, you can dodge like me, but you can't go to the army. So that sounds like a little thing now, but in those days, uh, white people didn't question apartheid very much. They're like, no, you know, what can I say? I've been called up, I must go. So that's, it starts on little things like that. When he became a student, he was exposed to the reality that 
a lot of illness and disease in South Africa is not uh, purely because people don't take medicine or don't live a healthy lifestyle. It's a product of a society that he saw was based on poverty, hunger, unemployment, dangerous working conditions. And like a lot of young men of his generation in South Africa, black as well as white, he was drawn towards the struggle to end apartheid and create a better society. And it's in that context that he involved himself increasingly in the trade union movement. I am Sipo Gubega. I was born and bred up in Alexandra Township. Neil, when he joined us and to become involved in the trade union activities, he was very eager to learn. Uh, he was very open to learning new things. Our position as political activists at that time was that uh, we would actually not be very happy with a person who would say he is for change in South Africa, but at the same time uh, go to the army and become part of, 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 of the repressive army of the apartheid regime. My name is Susan Jigelana, born in the Eastern Cape in the rural villages of uh, St. Matthews. The first thing that struck me about Neil was that we would meet with Neil at the union offices in the morning. Now I'm coming from home. Guess what? Neil is coming from work. I checked with him what was his story. He said, he then said, in order for him to be able to volunteer in the union work, but at the same time have income to put food on the table and pay rent, he had to do night shift at Chris Anibar. Now here is this young political activist from the Eastern Cape. He meets a, one of the white comrades, very few at that time. And that really struck me. Alan Fine is my name. I got involved in student politics at, at Wits University when I was there in the 1970s. In those days there was no Kasatu, there was the Federation of South African Trained Unions, FOSATU, and then a number of other groupings. So we started, uh, Emma and I, and Neil and various of his colleagues, there was Jan Teron, Oscar Mpeta and, and others, um, began meeting and thinking about how this was going to be able to happen, to move towards um, a more united trade union movement. And one of the first things we did was we started developing an idea for the establishment in Soweto um, of a trade union center, a, a place, a meeting place for trade unions, for trade union seminars and so on. At that time we had reading groups which was part, it was to deepen political understanding amongst all of us, but also bring more people into the struggle, you know. And um, so we'd read different, uh, quite theoretical works, see how they apply it right now. And Neil was working, he, he'd started work in the union, and but to keep himself going, he was doing uh, casualty, medicine casualty at Bar Baraguanath. So he was doing the all night shift on set, Friday and Saturday. So he'd work through the night at the hospital and then on the way back, he'd stop at my place and sit in the chair next to the bed. I'd, I'd go make him coffee and some breakfast. And we'd just talk, you know, and talk about what he saw that night, what he did but also about what was happening in the unions and so on. So that, that, those, those are in retrospect, quite precious time, you know, because uh, he's always quite tired, but, but really dedicated to go to the union offices, do what, what he had to do.
people like Neil, trade unions weren't simply about wages and working conditions and so long as we're okay, it doesn't matter what everybody else suffers. The vision was very much a type of unionism that was engaged with a larger society. The problems in the workplace are not simply problems, and it's very clear under apartheid, but it's even clear now, are not simply workplace problems. Workers face problems like bad services, rubbish uh, living areas, um, high levels of unemployment that you can't just solve with a wage negotiation. So the understanding was very much that trade unions are part of a broader society, a broader working class, and they have to take up the bigger issues. So for people like Neil, trade unions should be independent of the government. Um, they should not be controlled by political parties, but they should be political. They should champion ordinary people, not just around wages, working conditions, important as those are but also raise the broader things in society. And this is where people like Neil came into a collision with the apartheid state. If you look at who Neil was in 81, before he was detained, he wasn't playing a national role. He was the provincial organizer. Um, but he was part of this emerging group of unions that didn't stay away from political issues. Um, and it was a threat to the South African security police. There's also a racist interpretation that if you have African leaders of a union movement, they must be being controlled by a white person. Conspiracy theory is the white person is calling the shots. So I think he, he perhaps got additional attention on those grounds. Actually, meanwhile, he was learning from other people. He wasn't controlling anyone. He was learning from people like Oscar and Goethe and, and so on. The apartheid government did not want black workers, to be specific, to earn a better a salaries and have better working conditions. F for Neil to be party to, 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 to the building of workers' organization, that was, he, was, he became a thorn in the flesh of the apartheid government. But also, they knew he had actually chosen consciously chosen to become a, a active in the broader struggle and not a, your, 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 your workplace bread and butter issues. Now for them, such a person was an enemy of the apartheid government. You know, naturally, yeah, he, he, he wasn't the only um, trade unionist who was who came to be seen as an enemy of the workers. Um, you know, among those who were detained at the same time as us were three people from the um, South African Allied Workers Union, um, Sisa Njikalaina, Tozamile Kweta, and Sam Kikine. They were all on about their eighth round of detention because the security police used to detain them simply to get them out of their way. But their trade union, the South African Allied Workers Union, just kept on moving and was known as the most militant um, union. And, you know, those also were the kinds of people that Neil was associated with. Beyond that, he was a threat in that he put his energy into building a movement that could help threaten that state. Trade unions, although we forget it now, and we often judge trade unions by what we see today in trade unions where regrettably corruption and big man politics and um, poor member servicing are sadly true in quite a few unions. Trade unions were one of the major enemies of the apartheid state and one of the major forces that broke that state. By the late 1980s, trade unions were able to shut down the entire economy called mass political stairways. And he was part of that process. I think secondly, he was one of those people who stood up and did something about it because we can all oppose something. We can all sit and mumble and grumble. He put himself out there. Neil was a doctor, medical doctor. He was one of the doctors at uh, Krisani Barangwana Hospital in Soweto. His activities in the townships as well, uh, he was doing trade union activity in the township, but at the same time 
the, the, the health related matters. He faced aid training of, of people. Now, he was training them in the townships and not at the factory floor. For me, that was an opportunity. We, if we have such a person in our midst, that person can be very uh, useful in providing uh, your, your first aid uh, training as our people were getting injured. That was part of the interest that I, I had uh, in him. I went with him several times as a doctor now to, to uh, somebody, one of the workers or their families in, in the townships who needed a doctor. It's just absolutely beautiful, beautiful presence when he was treating a patient. My parents felt that he was wasting his medical um, career and experience by, you know, not doing medicine full time. Um, but he was, of course, working over weekends at Baraguanaka Hospital. Look, I, I think that as a young man, like many young men, like many youth, he was a rebel. Um, you know, he was close to his family, but he disagreed with his elders in the family. His father was quite conservative by all accounts. Having thought very deeply and philosophically about what his role was, he made the decision, one, he was not going to go into the army, and so therefore he also had to separate himself away from the family. The family didn't know where he was, so when they received his conscription papers, they wouldn't be able to forward them to him. His first real experience, I think, of being with black superiors, who were, you know, the superior medical officers he was working with, and he writes this to his parents. It was dated 15th of June, 1977. So almost a year after the massacre of young people in Soweto. And he writes, I am always grateful for the love and care you gave me as a child. But at some point, I had to evaluate the world from an independent perspective and make my own decisions. I am sorry for all the hurt I've caused you, but I'm sure that you realize that I am not standing against you or the family in particular, but against the whole social order. Stay well. Yours, Neil. So in this context of we knew detentions were coming, you don't really know what it's about, you don't know who's going to be detained next, and it was getting closer. But in fact, some people had been detained for two weeks and came out and knew about this close comrades list. So Neil knew about it, um, but he didn't tell me that I was also on the list. So the night before the detentions, he asked me to come and visit and told me about it. At that point, it wasn't kind of maybe we'll get detained, but this is going to happen. So when they arrived early the next morning, it wasn't a surprise. Um, and then you, Neil was followed everywhere he went for most of 1981. I was followed if I left home. If, if I could go to work without being followed, but if I came home, I would be followed. And there were a lot of dirty tricks, and we know who did it. It was Paul Erasmus breaking into the office, breaking things, peeing in the kettle. One night they tried to drive me off the road. So it was mostly irritation, but it was pot potentially dangerous. And we didn't know exactly what was brewing. Um, in retrospect, what had happened is they had got Barbara Hogan to give them a list of close comrades. They'd intercepted her underground communication. And they were using that list to try and bring put together a whole conspiracy that would take them to a treason trial. So it was clear we were heading towards something and it was quite um, intrusive because if friends came to visit us, they'd be followed home. Yeah. And um, I could go and follow, visit friends after work, but I couldn't come home and then visit because I'd be followed. So it's, 
it's quite intimidating. And it, Neil was smart, he worked out it was a five car system. It's very difficult to pick up a five car system. I once took a funny turn and then I could see it. Um, and we assumed that our house was bugged, but it wasn't. Um, and then they were tampering with the vehicles. We were parking on the street and they tampered with the union vehicle and there were a lot of suspicious accidents of unionists during this period. A lot of unionists were either killed or severely injured. And what they would do is they would deflate one tire and overinflate the other tire. Um, at the same time, he knew that the military police would sooner or later notice him. In fact, at a much later stage, apparently they both were after him and arguing about who was going to arrest him. I remember Cisa was detained from our house in, in Jeppistown. There were quite a number of us. I can't even remember the number, but by that time, Comrade Nilaget and a few other uh, activists were already in detention. And we would meet in the passage, you know, some of us, while we would sort of nod at each other. You can imagine the situation there, you're not allowed to speak to uh, one another. Initially, he looked fine. Of course, uh, the smile was really, you know, shall I say, psychological booster in such grim environment. My name is Maurice Smithers. I was uh, born in Khrafranet in the Eastern Cape. So I was in prison for about uh, for four months. After a month, they stopped interrogating me. When they were interrogating me, they were taking me from, from Randburg Police Station through to John Forster every time. So they would drive out to Randburg, pick me up, take me through there, check me in there, and then I would be interrogated by the captain. So what I saw happening was Neil basically being made to run up and down on the spot while cops were circulating him and, and at least one of them was hitting him, harassing him, not hitting hard, but harassing him with what looked like a rolled up magazine or something. It didn't look like, a, I think it was, it looked kind of white. It didn't look like a, like a baton or anything like that. So I don't think the intention was to hurt him but it was to harass him in the middle of him doing these exercises. Later, I began to observe a change in his uh, mood. I mean, you can see through the facial expression, but still, that's not something, there's, there was nothing one could do either than just to observe. But it all happened one day. We were in the, what I could call a small change room where we put our utensils. The security branch guys who were there were not looking, so he was quick to show me a mark here, red triangular mark. And uh, that was enough message to say, Comrade, if you see this, it means I'm being tortured. I was extremely emotional um, and, 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 and kind of angry with myself because there was kind of this feeling that I should have done something, that I could have done something, but didn't. What I did was I actually f forced myself to do the things that he had been doing. The running up and down on the spot, but like really pushing myself in a kind of very aggressive, angry, hysterical kind of way, you know, and doing push-ups, etc. you know, almost like trying to identify uh, 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 with him, you know. And then I thought to myself, what do I do now? Yes, they could, you know, they, they, they detained him, tortured him, they could not make him give up those core beliefs. That was a core challenge to the state.
Neil's story, and in particular his tragic death, I think exposed a lot of that system. How can it happen that a young man simply involved in a trade union can be picked up by the police, be in prison for 100 days, die in mysterious circumstances, have a court inquest that claims somehow he killed himself? Well, uh, I'm one of the people who was able to see him being carried down the passage. Uh, I think by then it was his dead body. Uh, that the night which is claimed that uh, he killed himself. Well, I, I suppose you can, you can imagine that says it all. Um, I had a policeman knock on my door at six o'clock in the morning, one morning, and I just thought he'd come to tell me that Neil had been released and could he be released to us? And so I opened the door, sort of full of hope. And the, man, and the policeman, who, who was a, a regular policeman, came in to tell me that Neil had been found dead. Um, and that, that he'd been found, he'd hanged himself, as they put it. Um, my immediate reaction was, what have you done to him? How have you killed him? What have you done that you've killed my brother? So when he died, it was really that everyone's worst fears had come true. There had been a leak. One of our friends in detention had managed to get information out saying he'd watched Neil being tortured. So that had, that had come out through Parliament, through Ellen Sisman. On the, the morning uh, um, that it was first reported that Neil had died, I got the Rand Daily Mail and there was the headline that Neil had died. And obviously I was completely freaked out by that. Um, you know, for, for, you know, because he died, um, because it immediately kind of raised the specter of others, including myself, maybe being, ending up in that same predicament. When we heard that Comrade Neil had died, a part of me died with him because we're not just ordinary friends, we're very close. Now that day we could not work when we heard that Comrade O'Neill had died, but we also had to, 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 to recover from the blow. Uh, in the process of having to recover, we said, what is it that we can do? to show that uh, 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 O'Neill was close in our hearts. We agreed that we are going to manufacture his coffin. Uh, the coffin that you, you may have seen in pictures, uh, I, I, I designed it as a woodworker and we made it with my colleagues in the Woodworkers Cooperative. Neil's Death in detention led to, and in a, in a strange way, as sad as it is, it contributed to the unification of the trade union movement because there were marches and demonstrations that followed his death. And he has continued to be remembered and certainly by all of those who were part of the trade union movement at the time. My, my colleague Emma Mashanini, who passed away about five years ago, she never forgot about him and she used to always talk about him and the sadness that she continued to feel um, because, because he was, should I stop now? Almost two things playing at once. The one thing, the certainty, he can't kill himself. It can't happen. Neil cannot commit suicide. And then this other thing, yeah, but just like, I can't commit suicide, like, could I be driven? You know, you'd get, so we live with that for years. We did not just lose a number, number one. No, we lost somebody very uh, important uh, in our lives and also in the lives of many South Africans. Pat Hate told so many lies and they, and they had a whole security apparatus to build the lie.
to make it look like it was real. And so this cut through all of that, you know, bring clarity and truth that there's certain people in our history we need to hold up. They, they're worthy of emulation. It's worthy to, to learn from his life, from who he was. So I think you're getting a bit emotional, but yeah, it's important. On the day of his funeral, each your hands back came to a standstill. You know, there was just this thing of thousands and thousands and thousands of people arriving and carrying the, the, the coffin all the way from St. Mary's Cathedral to West Park Cemetery, just and singing and so on. But uh, so that was some sort of what, you know, because now you've got the, the the symbol of, the, of actually a white man embraced by the, the black mass of, of militant uh, workers and, and youth. So there was massive coverage locally, there was massive coverage internationally. Um, I was not allowed out of detention, I was kept for another two months. But there's footage of the, the funeral, um, which I think really captures the, the spirit of the reaction. I was just amazed at the amount of support and love that everybody showed towards him. And so many people came up to me during the funeral and told wonderful stories about how they'd been helped by him. The non-racial character of our struggle for liberation in South Africa is firm in place and is growing. And the fact that the apartheid apparatus can they go to the extent of killing a white person, their own blood was an indication that uh, they are prepared to do anything even against their own to, uh, to stem or to reverse the advances of our struggle. This, this reopened inquest went very well. It, it, it was done, it was prepared with extraordinary detail. Um, the legal team was very um, thorough. Frank Dutton is probably one of the best investigators in the history of this country. He, he passed away earlier this year. He was working for the TRC as well. During that period, the court called forward witnesses, particularly fellow detainees, these were now men in their 60s um, who had been treated abysmally inside that dreadful John Forster Square police station. And they told stories in the witness stand that they'd never even spoken to their wives and family about and reduced most of them to tears. It was so humiliating, so painful that they had difficulty in recalling these awful times. This was 40 years on, the judge gave a most amazing judgment, a two and a half hour ju judgment, which he had examined things very, very closely. And it was a most fulsome and truthful judgment that could possibly be. And he declared that Neil had been murdered. Now, how do I take uh, the, the ruling? I'm saying one, the name of a comrade Neil Agate is cleared. I think one of the important things that people like Neil showed and one of the important things that people like Neil believed, not just them, but many other heroes in our country uh, and abroad, 
people like Vuya Silimini, uh, Ray Alexander, T.W. Tabedi, Bill Andrews. What they showed is it's important and essential to build an effective popular civil society. It's important for people to have member-driven organizations, both as spaces where people can practice and experience democracy in their daily lives, not just at elections. It's important that people like Neil are, are, are remembered and are held up as shining examples of how the world doesn't have to be like that. That we can, we can live and act differently. In 50 years time, South Africa will be a completely different country. Now, what is important is that a part of a history or the South African history should be taught to our young ones so that one, they are aware and two, they become part of that history by making sure Boguti, they also propel it uh, to, 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 to the future generations. It deserves a lot of credit for the very progressive role that um, Kasatu played in the ending of apartheid during the latter second half of the 1980s and the rebuilding of South Africa or the building of South Africa, of a democratic South Africa um, from 1994 onwards. I just feel for a start that he had absolutely no colour prejudice whatever, whatsoever or racial prejudice and we should all live with exactly that non-prejudicial nature as human beings. I've often wondered if he had been able to meet Steve Biko, my goodness those two would have had such interesting conversations because they both I think understood that racism is also a way of seeing the world. It's your consciousness. And if it's your consciousness, if it's, you can remake that. If you're aware of it, once you become aware of what's happening, you can then begin to remake it. And I think Neil said about remaking himself. Somebody like Neil is an important role model. This was somebody who didn't sell out his principles. He lived by his principles, the way he lived his life, the way he didn't do the struggle for a salary the way he gave up uh, many of the opportunities in his life. He could have started to build himself a little business, set up a medical practice, he sacrificed all of that, sacrificed um, relations with people who didn't agree with where he was going, alienated himself in big ways from a large part of the white community. I think, show a man who operated by principle. This was not a man who would sell out. This was not a man who would steal money and then claim he was doing it for the people or for transformation. People like this, people who are willing to do everything for a cause, are the sort of people who can change the world. I'm Tracy van Mollendorf. I am the senior school head at Kingswood College and um, an educator. The class of 1917, old Kingswoodian class of, of 1970, wanted to acknowledge and remember Neil Agate and they um, donated an award and drew up a criteria where we acknowledge um, a child that stands up against injustice, um, that serves the community and through various community engagement um, projects. So really just acknowledging a contribution and someone who has the inner strength to stand up and fight for injustice yes, or against injustice. Yeah. My name is Kaylee Smith and I come from Alexandria and I go to Kingswood College in Grahamstown. I was the recipient of the Neil Agate Award this year and I'm very honoured to receive this award um, to be known in the legacy of Neil Agate with his service above self. In the first lockdown when it first started in 2020 about, 
I started making jewelry and art and I decided that uh, I didn't need the money. And when my mom was chatting to me, she told me that there was someone in my town that was in need, a mother that had just lost her job and she was single. So I started selling this jewelry and this art that I had made. And what I did with the money was bought necessities, toiletries and groceries and gave to this mother. And that just transformed into something I could do with my time in lockdown and I started a charity business called Alex Angels, which comes from where I stay, Alexandria. And now I make jewelry and sell it to people at hostel, around town and online as well. And um, what I do with the money is I buy groceries and toiletries and give it to single and new mothers in my hometown. Through the Neil Agate, we have a memorial service every year where we acknowledge um, Neil Agate and others who have given up their lives to fight for human rights. Next to the altar in the front of the Kingswood College Memorial Chapel is the Neil Agate stained glass window. It was unveiled on the 30th of November 1990 by his mother and father in the presence of his brother, the headmaster, some contemporaries and representatives from the school. It represents blind Bartimaeus being healed by Jesus and depicts the mysterious circumstances at that stage that no one knew how he died when he died in detention on that fateful day in February. The other wonderful significance is that this picture of Jesus opening blind Bartimaeus' eyes also means that Jesus opened the eyes of people's hearts and invited us to see people differently. And Neil was doing just that, helping us to see people differently as equals, as dearly loved children of God. The text at the top of this window comes from the book of Job and it says, did not my heart grieve for the poor? The Neil Eggett Labour Studies Unit is named after Neil, uh, partly because we're deeply inspired by his example and his values. And I think we try to carry forward his legacy in that. We're not in the business of uh, press releases and grand statements. I think change can be a slow process, and change isn't going to be driven by us, it's going to be driven by ordinary people.